bright people, students, staff, faculty and trustees, Chancellor Bashini, and bright allies present in Robert Carr Chapel and joining us by live stream. Good morning. It is truly a joy to be among you at this convocation, this in-person convocation, and to have the opportunity to reflect with you on the theme preparing for the unexpected. This theme might seem ominous to some, especially because we have started this academic year at a most challenging time in Christian theological education, with consequences being seen in Bright's life, especially with the decreasing student population. Yet I'm hoping that as I share, we all will be opened to greater appreciation that in the midst of the distress of our time, opportunities are being given to those of us connected to Bright, those of us who are committed to resist Bright becoming an anachronism. Instead, in keeping with the best intentions of our founders, as fueled by a bold pioneering world, we are willing to exercise creative risk-taking that is required to place our institution on the trajectory of thriving and the trajectory that will enable us to develop robust witness that is relevant to this 21st century and beyond. There's no doubt that our diminishing student population is in part due to internal deficiencies. The fact that as persons who work at Bright, we don't always do the best in organizing life, promoting the witness of our institution. At the same time, it is undeniable that the impact in the wider context of American Christianity and theological education has had a significant role to play in the distresses of our present life. The Pew Report, the Gallup polls have been tracking the situation in American Christianity with implications for theological education for quite some time. The Pew Report shows that 63% of Americans claim to be Christian. This is down from 73% a decade ago. Of the rema remaining percentage, 6% identify with non-Christian faiths, and the rest are in the broad none category that include some who self-identify as atheists or agnostics, and approximately 20% who classify their religion as nothing in particular. This figure is 6% higher than it was five years ago, and 10 points higher than a decade ago. For me, the picture becomes even more challenging when I consider that across the board, only 41% of US adults now say religion is very important in their everyday lives. Because this has to include some of the 63% who claim to be Christian. This picture is enhanced by the Gallup poll information, which shows that in recent years, belief in God has fallen the most among young adults situated in the liberal side of the socio-political spectrum. The constituencies that make up this liberal category shows a drop of 10 or more percentage points when comparing the present figures to an average of the 2013 to 2017 polls. Most other subgroups are ex have experienced at least some decline, 
although cons those who classify themselves as conservatives and those who are married have had essentially no change. The lamentation we hear across Christian spheres, in which we at Bright also participate, reflects the fact that we are associated with traditions that have been toppled from their privileged place in Christendom, as it is expressed in the American society and in other parts of the Western Hemisphere. Listen to one form of lamentation, as expressed in the 2021 article, Imagining the Future of Theological Education. If theological education was ever in peril, it is now. The general state of higher education is gloomy, with the pandemic only ad adding to the gloom. But as everyone involved in Christian higher education knows, seminaries and Christian colleges are, were imperiled before the crisis. Looking in depthly at the ecclesial background to this consternation, Lee Beach of the Baptist affiliated McMaster Divinity School in Canada expressed the pain of many in the main title of his book, The Church in Exile. He makes the following declaration. While the church once helped define various forms of empire in the Western world, its influence has abated, and there is within contemporary culture deconstruction of former beliefs, patterns of life, and conventions that define the world for many generations, but no longer do. This tearing down of the structures of modernity is akin to a revolution that strips power away from those in control and dismantles the systems that perpetuated their power. As a political revolution, it leaves those who enjoyed a place at the table of power scrambling to discover where they now fit within a new cultural and social reality. In the post-Christian revolution, he says, it is fair to say that the church is one of the former power brokers who once enjoyed a place of privilege and is now seeking to find where it belongs amid the ever-changing dynamics of contemporary culture. Having examined forms of relationship between church and state and identified potential abuses, Beach goes on to say, there are times when the church must see itself as an alien within the host culture. For the church today, he says, this requires an orientation that understands that while once we were at home, this is no longer the case. Our situation of having moved from the center to the margin is indeed a form of exile. As was the case in the situation presumed by Isaiah 43, the section read, the notion of exile as used by Beach may well assume a potential return to a former state of prominence. However, in our situation, this is not necessarily a desirable occurrence. Some would suggest that important to understanding our plight is the admission that being at home in America and other locations involved our complicity with Christendom. Christendom as it baptized colonialization, empire, white supremacy, racism, sexism, heteronormativity. As such, the author of Aliens in a Native Land, who is usually among us, might suggest that the question that should have guided the operations of churches and fed the ethos of Christian divinity schools is as follows. What does it mean to live as an alien in our country and our world? 
when the cause of being an alien is our obedience to Jesus Christ? How can a Christian witness persist on the sustained threat within a social order diametrically opposed to it? Returning to the scriptural text, the prophetic voice does encourage Israel's remembering of former things, which had displayed God's consistent faithfulness toward them. Yet this remembering that gives assurance that God had not abandoned them sets the stage for that which seems to be the high point in the reading. And it provides challenging inspiration for the journey that is ahead of us at Bright. You, we, who God did not abandon, even when you violated the relationship through greed, deception, violence, are being given the opportunity to participate in something radically new and different that is being manifested in your presence that could shift the focus of your attention and redirect the trajectory of your existence. So, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Can you not see it? The point, I believe, is this. While there should be attention to our past, and what we, lear what we can learn from it, we must resist the urge to become fixated on it. We will not realize new possibilities by hankering after some romanticized past. The good old day when congregations seemed robust, and I say seemed robust, when there was a regular stream of mostly white men confident into their sense of call, uh, moving into places like Bright Divinity School, when at some point in the period before 2006, Bright had over 300 students crammed in that space over there. Believe it. So that we are now tempted to conclude that the way things occurred in the past should determine the details of the present and can provide the best guidance for our future. The prophetic voice from second I die, speaking into our situation at what might seem to be a dismal period in our institutional life and life across theological education generally. Pay attention, the prophetic voice is saying. Pay attention to the signs of newness that is occurring in strange places. Not the places that we are accustomed to look, but in strange places. Places you might barely be able to discern in the haze of our worry, our sadness, our grieving, our anxiety, even our resentment. Something dramatically new is arising with a quality that cannot be reduced to anything we've ever experienced before. Verse 19 and 20 of Isaiah 43 pictures this as new streams of refreshing, replenishing, revitalizing possibilities already breaking out in the midst of our painful, distressing, seemingly parched, dry, and unproductive situation. Yet, the wild animals, the jackals, the owls, have already experienced it. And they are praising God for its impact while we are flustered and turned over in our emotions. As we consider what these wild animals might be in our time, please entertain my suggestion that for over a century, a new trajectory of life has been emerging in the Western world and in these United States even as some of our ecclesial ancestors were perp perpetrating the sins of Christendom, imperialism, colonialism, racism, sexism, heterosexism, reflect on the role of phenomena like the 20th century being the age of science, the collapse of enlightenment confidence which moved the turn to the Noah from the purely rational 
to the experiential, the rise of epistemological and cultural relativism, which is partly due to the increased diversification of immigration, bringing global cultures and religions in closer proximity to each other, so that we experience persons beneath the prejudice characterization we once used to other them. Having discovered individuality, there is a contemporary struggle to understand what it entails, how to deal with the associated blessings and responsibilities. Then as I, we were sharing at the recent faculty retreat, there is the most recent phenomenon which first emerged with the development of the microtrip, and which Thomas Friedman claims to have blown across, apart the world generated by the first industrial revolution. It has created, he says, a new digital ecosystem that is wiring and rewiring all of our brains, including those who are youngest. It is fast. The pace of change keeps accelerating. It is fused. Human life is bound together even more tightly. It is deep because the impact is everywhere all the time, and also because it permeates the very consciousness of, of persons and affects their outlook on life. How do these people operate in churches who are still structured and operate in the conventional way? It is open. Now accessibility is non-optional. If a matter, enterprise is worthy of attention and involvement, the doors must be open, the path must be clear, and quick access must be provided. How do we in our congregations, in our social organizations, and in our theological institutions reorient our lives to relate to people with these kinds of brains and these kinds of expectations? with worldviews and spiritualities that are being nurtured by 24-7 bombardment by social platforms. In other words, for both good and ill, traditional boundaries of all types have been transgressed. Protective walls have been torn down. Expectations for relationships between spheres of knowledge and experience have been shifted dramatically. While specialization is still vital to intellectual depth, interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary engagement and intersectional approaches are simply assumed by more persons who expect that the concepts we entertain will visibly will be visibly applicable in everyday life and these people fervently desire that something radical and new in its liberating and humanizing capacity will occur to change life for the better how do we reorient our lives reshape the dynamics of our institutions and our interaction so that we can communicate effectively and participate in the education of such persons. Some of the contemporary gurus of the scientific revolution that has accelerated in our 21st century has described what is occurring in terms of emergence, a phenomenon that occurs when an entity or a process is observed to have properties its parts do not have on their own. Properties are behaviors that only emerge when the parts interact in a wider whole. Is this serendipitous novelty, as some would say, or more elegant complexity, as others say? Or do we pre prefer the language of uh, Vanderbilt, Hegel-inspired, emeritus professor Peter Hodgson? as he searches for theological language to explicate what he sees occurring in our contemporary time. He claims that there are three dominant cultural quests in our time, the emancipatory, the ecological, and the dialogical. He suggests that these quests, we, in these quests, we can discern the winds of the spirit 
luring us to freedom, love, and wholeness. Hodgson declares, God's presence and power, understood as spirit, are configured in a multitude of ways by the contours of the world itself. Just as the prevailing wind breaks into currents, as it comes into contact with land and water, hills and valleys, heat and cold, winds of the spirit are sweeping through the world, scattering and gathering, leveling and lifting, overturning and setting free. This is God at work in the world, he says. So he would suggest to us, understand your dislocation, understand your disorientation, understand the disruption that has occurred in your traditions and even in your institutional life as God at work in the world. It is infused and guided, even buffeted by these winds that bright and other institutions like us are being forced to pursue discernment of what the Spirit might be saying to us regarding the character of our responsibilities in the 21st century. When winds shift, terrains change, and conditions modify with impact on our circumstance and those of those around us, we are required to reposition appropriately in order to operate well in light of continued and or shifting vocational requirements. And this is what is at stake, I suggest to you. A new understanding of our vocation as an institution. What are we about? What is our calling in this 21st century and beyond? My own approach to emergence is informed by embrace of, some would have heard this before, the Whiteheadian position, that creativity is the ultimate metaphysical principle at the heart of existence. As alluded to by Dr. Fluker last week, at last week's chapel gathering, creativity is the first characteristic of God that we hear about in the scripture. And I suggest that it is this creativity that has fueled the evolution of life towards the emergence of human beings, you and me, with self-consciousness and great imaginative powers, with finite relational freedom and responsibility. It is with these features that we constitute life most conscious of itself and become, as Dr. Fluker put it last week, co-creators with God. How do we pursue that role in the dynamic that I have been describing in the nature of emergence and the ultimate mystery of God? We humans cannot predict the full character of the new world in emergence. Where a life form transition is occurring. This which is frightening us even as it enthralls and enlivens the pursuits of others. Each individual in this chapel, as life conscious of itself, who can very deliberately employ creativity with a, an awareness of the dynamic relation between individual expression and communal purpose, can claim with a sense of awesome responsibility that what emerges at Bright going forward. In these United States, in theological education generally, is partially dependent on how we dispose ourselves towards the future. So friends, in the midst of the dangerous madness that seems to characterize much of life in these United States at present, a relevant motivating question at this point for our efforts at Bright should be, if institutions like ours and the churches to which we're attached shrivel and wane in influence because we give in to fear-generated cynicism, if we allow ourselves to be sucked into the slow of despond and allow our creativity and drive to die, if we, by neglect or 
intentional abandonment cause the community of faith to which we are attached to simply shrivel away. Which other communities of faith? Which other divinity schools and seminaries will have sway in influencing the form of life that will become dominant in these United States? If we are neglectful, if we are irresponsible, if we out of fright abandon our responsibility, to whom do we leave? the role of shaping the worldview that will guide our lives in the United States and in Western Hemisphere into the future? That's an important question to answer as we dispose ourselves to Bright's future. As I look towards Bright's future, with the expectation of amazing change, I'm convinced that the commitment to justice will continue to anchor our considerations of what we ought to look like. In early summer, I had a conversation with one of our erudite scholars, and he introduced to me the concept of uber justice. This person suggested that uber justice is fundamental to the, our ability to fruitfully address the long history of oppression fueled by white supremacy in this nation. Some of us will recognize the German proposition used as prefix, refers to a state or action that involves elevated quality, intensity, or quantity. We give excess effort to that process. Some would say we give 110% towards the achievement of that which is purposed so that it might be realized with a super superior level of quality. Over summer, I thought a lot about this concept of uber justice. And my mind went back to my original homeland, Jamaica, where I grew up in, immediate post, in the immediate post-colonial period when we had heady aspirations of how we would live into the future, the equity and justice that would characterize our lives, the freedom and responsible exercise of power that would prevail in this nation. I came of age when this evolved into a political ideology which was intended to establish this equity, not just religiously, but socially and politically, that there would be excessive attention to the marginalized and vulnerable in the land, and there would be the creation of a new international economic order where such equity and justice would be evident across the board. I grew to the place where the pursuits of justice by different people resulted in Jamaicans killing each other in the interest of their perspective on this justice. It is a violence that has not abated since that day. So a vision of justice intended to elevate the character of a nation has made this nation the topmost murder place for murder in Latin America and the Caribbean. There, was a, there came the point where the fabled African spider Bernanzi, who had a powerful place in Africa, was used in order to address slavery, came to represent trickery in the Jamaican society. So that nobody, people had a difficulty trusting each other. Because people could justify trickery in the interest of what they perceived as justice. With oppression and slavery as the background. So I suggest to you that uber justice going into our future 
needs to be associated with super, with uber, uber realism. That all of us are weak, frail, sinful human beings. We are all capable of corrupting justice. We are all capable of operating in our own self-interest. We are all capable of manipulation. It means that those of us who move into Bright's future with an interest in justice must never glamorize or romanticize any person, group, or movement. What we must be is single-minded in our pursuit of the phenomenon in which justice everywhere undergirds justice anywhere undergirds justice everywhere. The pursuit of justice in any sphere on behalf of any people is carried out cognizant of the needs of justice of other peoples in other places. This in mind, I have deep appreciation for Caribbean American author Audre Lorde's challenge in a collection of essays titled Sister Outsider. She says, the true focus of revolutionary change is never merely the oppressive situation we seek to escape, but the peace of the oppressor which is implanted deep inside each of us. In another presentation included in the, the collections, he speaks to white feminists in a way that applies to anybody who has been under the thumb of an oppressor. She says, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. They may allow us temporarily to beat him at his own game, but they will never enable us to bring about genuine change. So we must choose our tools properly. We must always be in the business of self-scrutiny. We must always be pursuing repentance as we pursue justice in Bright's future. I will move closer to an end by saying Uber justice must be connected to Uber real realism. Uber realism must be committed to Uber integrity. We cannot achieve noble ends by ignoble means. We cannot. Because the means are the end in process. So let us be careful about how, how we pursue the new world that we seek, where justice is at its heart. The way we pursue it is vital to that which is achieved in the end. So friends, I encourage us to think and consider, contemplate, have conversations together. If you will, you might want to approach me with anything I've said this morning, but let us be considering ourselves with this future that we are imagining, this future to which we are being called to be, this exciting, dangerous future. Because we don't know fully what it will be. What I'm hoping we will come to recognize is that we all have a call. A call individually and a call collectively, a call institutionally. So let us embrace this call this morning. Embrace it so that it ensures that we live into our vision the vision of a, trans, a world transformed by God's love, mercy, and justice. Let it energize us to pursue our mission, to educate and inspire people to serve God's diverse world as leaders in churches, the academy, and public life. Let it help us to operate in light of the triad of values 
which I think is such an impressive statement. Scholarship that engages churches, the academy and public life. Justice that enhances diversity, flourishing and wholeness, and practice that enlivens intellectual, spiritual, and professional growth. Thanks be to God. Amen.